Okay, thank you for joining uh, the 2021 uh, LP Variable uh, virtual meeting. And my name is uh, D.W. Park from Assam Medical Center. I'm going to introduce the co moderator and the worldwide famous individual cardiologist, the Raj Makar, the, from the Cedar Sinai Hospital from the United States. So I'm going to introduce the, our the, uh, discussant and the Kem Tin, Dr. Kem Tin Chan, Dr. Eui Hyung Go, Dr. Mao Shin Rin, Dr. Watchin Budhari. Dr. Prabhan Chandra. Okay, and uh, we're gonna uh, start the live case demonstration. Okay, Raj, uh, Dr. Raji, could you introduce the move to the live case room in China? Uh, terrific, uh, thank you, Dr. Park. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to have such an esteemed panel. And of course, uh, uh, very, very skilled operator, Dr. Jian Wang. Uh, he's going to show us a couple of cases of uh, TAVR in bicuspid aortic stenosis. So uh, let's go go ahead. Um, you know, Dr. Wang, can you can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Okay. And, uh, Dr. Park, Dr. Barkar, and uh, all of uh, moderate uh, panelists, organizers. Uh, we are we are, <laughs> we feel so honored <clears throat> to have the opportunity to do a live demo in the important event, 2021 APR. So first, uh, I will introduce you my colleagues, Dr. Liu. Uh, so, and the other uh, several doctors here, uh, Federals, some, uh, and also an echocardiographer and an anesthesiologist over there. So, uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, first, I will invite uh, Dr. Liu to introduce the case today. Okay, please. Okay. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, the patient is 70 years old lady. The patient has recurrent exertional dyspnea for four months. And the patient has a history of coronary artery disease and a COPD. Next one. And uh, the STS score is about 6% for this patient. Next one. And from the echo, we can see the patient has very severe aortic stenosis. So from, we can see right here, the AVA about 0.33 centimeter square and the maximum velocity about uh, 5.6 meter per second, and the mean gradient is 84 uh, millimercury. And the LVEF is good, and the, the LVEDD is 4.3 centimeters, okay. Next one. And because we can see from the CT, we can see some calcification in the LAD and the other coronary artery. So we uh, did the angiography before the procedure, and we can see the uh, both, we can see the uh, about 30 to 50 percent stenosis, and it is unnecessary for us to do the stent for this patient. Next one. And from the CT scan, we can see right here there's some calcification, severe calcification, and we can see some uh, calcification in the annulus. And from the middle line, we can see right here the patient is type one bicuspid. And the calcification is, calcification is severe. And we can see fusion from the right coronary and the non coronary. Next one. And the coronary height is high enough for this patient. Next one. And from the left image, we can see very, very severe calcification in the leaflet and in the annulus. Next one. And we can see the calcification in the LVLT. The excess of this patient is good. And the uh, angulation is about 47 degree. Okay, next one. Yeah, this is the femoral and uh, iliac artery. It looks good. Next one. Uh, so in summary, for this patient, uh, the severe symptomatic aortic stenosis and uh, uh, moderate surgical risk. And this is a type one bicuspid aortic stenosis with very severe calcification in the leaflets, annulus, and the LVLT. The procedural strategy, we will use the Venus A+. Plus. This is the repositionable or retrievable second generation valve in China. And we will use the sedation plus the local anesthesia. And today, this patient, we will use Hanzo solution, super annular sizing strategy. And we, right now, Professor Wang, just the leading in the RCT study in China. And this patient is uh, just in the Hangzhou solution group. 
And this is the introduction of the Venus A plus valve. So you, you know, the Venus A valve is designed very special for the high radio force for the bicuspid aortic stenosis and severe calcification. And the professor one and our team worked together with Venus Vendetech to develop the second, the Venus A plus valve and make it retrievable and repositionable. Okay, this all. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Dr. Marcard, Dr. Park, and all of friends. And we are we already uh, finished uh, some steps. So we <clears throat> prepared a red femoral artery, uh, <clears throat> red femoral artery accessible, and uh, the, put the pigtail in the, uh, we, we have been crossed over the valve, and uh, now uh, we are measured the pressure gradient. Uh, so can you see the, the hemodynamic screen? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, we, first we did the angiogram. Uh, you can see the pitching, uh, the valve is a very severe calcified uh, with a moderate uh, regurgitation. Yes. Yeah. So now we, we, uh, we show you the, the hemodynamic screen. Okay. So uh, the pressure gradient is more than, I think the 100, almost 130, right? 140, 140, 140. 140. Yes. millimeter mercury. So very yeah. high the pressure gradient. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we are going to do the balloon valvotomy. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is your strategy about the balloon valvotomy? Do you regularly do the balloon valvotomy or you, you don't do for this kind of patients? Yeah. What, what is your idea? I, so I think first of all, Dr. Wang, I think you're showing us a very challenging case. Uh, so this is not, you know, there are some bicuspids that are very favorable anatomy. Uh, certainly, I think the high level of, uh, high degree of calcification makes this, uh, you know, reasonably challenging. I think the good thing here is that your ostium of your left main coronary artery, right coronary artery seem to be away from the tip of the leaflets. So I think that is uh, something that is in favor. I saw a little bit, tiny bit of LVOT calcium, but, but not a lot of LVOT calcium. So that also sort of goes uh, in, in, in your favor. Now, the other thing was that I didn't see, uh, though there was quite a bit of calcium, I didn't see, at least on the volume rendered image that you showed, a calcified rafe, which would have made things even harder. So, so I think while, uh, so there is nothing easy about this case, but I wanted to um, point out that there are some things that sort of justify moving ahead with a, with a taver in this particular uh, uh, patient. I just wanted to ask you, what is the, what was the maximum aortic uh, diameter? Uh, maybe I missed it. Do you remember it? Was it more than four, less than four? Uh, less, than, uh, 45. less than 45. Less than 45. Okay, excellent. So I think, you know, occasionally that becomes a point of discussion between the surgeons and interventionists, but I think it's good to, uh, good to have, uh, you know, below 4.5 as well. This is a borderland aortic, a aortic yeah. Uh, from our strategy, regularly for this kind of patients, we do the balloon valvotomy. So, do the balloon valvotomy has uh, two purposes. One is uh, for the sizing of the supraannular size. Yeah. The other purpose is uh, is for the, uh, to dilate the orifice of the valve. Is uh, mm, make yeah. the device. <clears throat> yeah. So I. Uh, I... Not eating. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think we should also get the opinion of the panelists that balloon valvuloplasty, especially in such a high gradient, you know, uh, I think it's, it's useful. Uh, I think, um, you know, in addition to uh, uh, not struggling while you're crossing mm -hmm. uh, and also the help in sizing it might give you, mm -hmm. um, you know, often, uh, you know, these aortas are dilated. So then if you really have to push hard especially with some of the valve systems, then you're leaning, you know, knuckling into the ascending aorta, mm -hmm. uh, which can cause a little bit of uh, issues with aortic dissection. So I think it's always, in my opinion, unless the calcium is very low, it's a very good idea to actually pre-dilate. But I also want to ask our discussants, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Chen or Dr. Bodari, what, if, if they have any uh, thoughts or ideas. Um, hello, can you hear me? Okay, yes. we, can, we can hear you. Yeah, it's Dr. Kam Tim Chen from Hong Kong. I fully agree with the uh, panelists and also the moderator about the strategies of this case. Since it's very heavily calcified by superbay or the valve, usually we will do routine uh, balloon valve plastic first before uh, just putting in the valve. And because the calcium also extends a bit into the LVOT tract, so I think it's very wise to use a 
self-expandable and retrievable and repositionable uh, venous valve. We don't have experience with the venous valve, but in Hong Kong, we'll tend to use uh, mostly the Medtronic uh, uh, valve, the um, Evolut, okay? And one thing that we'll do more for these particular cases, because the calcium is so heavy, well, in Hong Kong, we'll routinely put in a cerebral protection devices. We'll use the Sentinel devices as an extra means for protections of any embolic shock during the procedures. But I understand that it's not yet available in China. So maybe we'll do slightly different. We'll put in a cerebral protection device routinely. So uh, uh, Dr. Wang, the, what is your the strategy for variables, uh, the balloon sizing? This is uh, the uh, how big... Yes, uh, this, uh, the patient was uh, enrolled for the RCT study, Hanzhou solution. Mm -hmm. uh, now we modify the Hanzhou solution different from before, uh, different, different from the previous Hanzhou solution. We just uh, uh, use a single balloon uh, <clears throat> to one, one time just one balloon uh, sizing strategy. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, copy the, the size of the 20, balloon. 22.3. Uh, so we will use 20 uh, millimeter uh, balloon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so because annual yeah. space is just about 26. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we would like to mm -hmm. decide 23 or 26 for this patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. so that's a 20 balloon, huh? it completely 20 balloon. Started. Yeah. So now we used to be yeah, change what? Uh, change what? used to be we select the uh, the balloon size. Oh yeah, so we we So uh, you know we have Dr. Chandra on on the line. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, there are two things, uh, Dr. Um, Raj, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, is that I can see that Dr. Uh, Shan is using, a, look, looks like a Lederquist wire, which I totally agree. In a situation like very heavily calcified valve, bicuspid valves, it is better to use a Lederquist because it tracks the valve better, number one. And number two is that about the pre-dilatation, in such a heavily calcified, I will all go with the for example, you know, for the, you know, at least 23 valve, if it is a 26 annulus, because otherwise the valve doesn't expand so well. So these are the two things which I can, you know, think of at this stage. And certainly uh, as he has done the balloon autography, uh, it is quite a good idea. However, the quadris were quite high and nice, so was not so necessary. But nevertheless, I think this appears to be a good strategy. Mm -hmm. We we used to select the balloon size from small balloon to the to the larger, but now we drag it. Now we the, the currently Hanzo solution. So we just select the balloon, just a, a w lower than the a smaller than the annular, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So but uh, close to the annular, but mm -hmm. not not equal or larger than annular. Mm -hmm. So just a one time balloon yeah. sizing. So very important when you inflate the balloon simultaneously, you do the angiogram to yeah. see. First is to see whether uh, there is a, a waste sign or not, mm -hmm. then say the seeding is good or not. Yes. So like that case, usually regularly for this kind of case, uh, most patient will have a very good seeding. Yeah. So you can see clearly the waste sign. So the patient is uh, waste signs so not not so clear, but still okay. We yeah. can see the waste sign, but the seeding is very good. Yeah. So when we uh, when we do the angiogram, we didn't see any contrast back to the left ventricle. So yeah. no leakage. Yes, so, yeah. so then we base it on the waste size to make a decision how big a size of a device we are going to have. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, uh, the these are twenty balloons, right? Yes. So the I think that the waste is nineteen to twenty. So we now we depend on usually we uh, we select the device uh, four to five millimeters larger than the, the balloon size. So the patient we we may need a, according to our protocol. Uh, uh, because there's uh, waste, clear waste, and no revegetation. So according to our protocol, we can downsize because this is the Hanzo solution group. So we will use 23 minus a valve for this patient. Yes. <laughs> if this patient uh, recruitment for for the control group, annulus based, then we will use 26. Yeah, mm -hmm. so because this Hanzo solution, we will use 23. Okay. You mean the supra annular sizing is mainly based on the balloon fabuloplasty, right? 
yes yes mm-hmm. uh, so yes very interesting dr raj uh, can you just you know uh, clarify this point of home zone solution versus the inverse mm-hmm. sizing thing well uh, i think uh, from what i understand uh, dr you know dr wang please correct me uh, you know uh, so it's basically supra annular sizing versus annular sizing right is that the randomized clinical trial yes. yeah yeah yes. i think yes. it's a it's a reasonable question to answer because there is quite a bit of controversy some people are absolutely against the um, you know the uh, supra annular sizing yeah and and there are some people who are quite passionate about it so i think it is it is reasonable to um, to answer this now if i can understand what you were saying is that because on the balloon you saw a waist right so therefore uh, you feel comfortable downsizing it in a supra supra annular fashion because is that is that correct yes. because yes. normally the supra annular sizing is done by measuring looking at ct mm-hmm. and 4 or 5 mm above the annulus so is it different here yes uh, <clears throat> hangzhou solution now we are we are studying the rct study to Uh, to say whether the Hanzo solution is good or not for the bicuspid aortic valve stenosis patient. So the key, the key uh, point is the superannular sizing or the annular sizing. Yeah. So you know the superannular sizing cannot depending on the CT scan because mm-hmm. you don't know how big a force. So, mm-hmm. so if the superannular sizing strategy, you have to use the balloon sizing. Otherwise, you cannot, you cannot do. Okay. So, so we use the super. Just uh, compare the uh, super size, uh, super annular sizing with the annular sizing to see uh, okay. what it, which is better in for this kind of patient with this kind of at the anatomy. Okay, okay. the device, device. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, that's that shit. Okay, Dr. Wang, the what is the main hypothesis of that trial? Is the super annular sizing is better than annular sizing? So, what is the main uh, hypothesis? <laughs> Uh, our hypothesis is a uh, super, uh, super. Yeah, absolutely, it's a uh, super, uh, superior, yeah. mm-hmm. superior, uh, superiority. Uh, mm-hmm. Study design. Uh, actually, the primary endpoint is uh, is uh, uh, of course mortality, mortality, stroke, mm-hmm. or then moderate. Com- composite, video. composite the uh, endpoints. Uh, yeah. Mortality, stroke, yeah. uh, pacemaker implantation, mm-hmm. and uh, moderate yeah. or severe uh, mature uh, uh, yeah, yeah. uh, aortic regurgitation. Those are composite endpoints, okay. and uh, many the secondary endpoints. Okay, sure. I think it's necessary uh, to answer the question in the world. Yeah, uh, it's I... always argue annular sizing or super annular sizing. But yeah. for our experience, uh, actually from the our cohort studies, for these kind of patients, absolutely the super annular sizing is better than annular sizing, especially to decrease the pacemaker implantation. But the mm-hmm. uh, pressure gradient, residual pressure gradient is uh, quite acceptable. Is it comparable? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Can I ask a question, Dr. Wang? This is Dr. Wang Sibudara from from Thailand. So I guess the key okay. for, for the trial would be the the determination of the balloon size that you would select to use in the protocol, right? Oh no. Uh, the 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 purpose of the study is to compare the super sizing with the annular sizing, super right. annular sizing with the annular sizing, which is better. So okay. in this case, when you evaluate the uh, you you. You, when you want to evaluate the superannular size, you have to use balloon sizing. You cannot right. use the CT. The CT is not believable for superannular sizing. It's a, it's a, it's a quite a believable. It's a quite a, quite a good for the annular sizing, but not good for the superannular sizing because you don't know how big a force of so, the superannular structure. So the balloon size is somewhere in between the minor axis and the major axis of the annulus. Yeah, we according to the parameter derived the diameter. And then we decide the balloon size. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you know, if the annulus between 20 to 23, we will use 20 balloon. If the annulus between 23 to 26. So uh, and- this device, uh, second generation, and uh, Venus, uh, actually, uh, we, uh, we uh, involved the development of the second generation a lot, mm-hmm. second generation Venus a lot. We, we work with the engineer and uh, Mm-hmm. Do a lot of design and uh, do the animal study and uh, then the preclinical study. Should be okay now. Okay. Uh, it's very hard to push. Okay, Dr. Wang, nowadays uh, for implantation of uh, uh, cervix, 
expandable valve and the cosmic overlay fuel is frequently used. Uh, do you uh, sometimes use the cosmic overlay fuel and the implantation of a Venus A plus? Yes, we would like to use it. So, mm -hmm. However, because this patient is the fusion from the right coronary and the non coronary, we will not awesome. use the cosmic overlay for this patient. So, uh, Dr. Wang, can you uh, tell us about that marker? You know, not all of us are familiar with this uh, valve system, uh, the second generation. So we see a marker. What is that marker? Yeah, this is a, there's a three marker right here. Yeah, yeah for 23 uh, valve. Yeah, this is a five millimeter. The height is a five Got millimeter. It. Okay. Yeah, even 26, over 26, just a six millimeter height. Uh, <clears throat> so regularly, uh, we start uh, uh, zero to two. Mm -hmm. uh, lower than the, the, the annulus to start to release the device. So uh, because the, the pigtail is not in the bottom of uh, uh, non coronary sinus, so we can yeah. make sure that from the angiogram, yeah, it's a good position. the position is uh, maybe a, a positive one below the annular. Yeah. We can see the classif classified uh, Mm -hmm. uh, yes. The annulus are a little bit classified. So from the classified, we can make judgment yes. how deep our device. Mm -hmm. Usually we less than two millimeters. Yeah, I think it is zero. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a zero? Yeah. You can so, okay, I see. So uh, oh. start the pacing, 100 Shiboba. Check again or not? Uh, one more angiogram, Shiboba. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, it's a one, it's a one. I think it's a, it's a one or two. Uh, now we start the pacing, we gradually release. Because it's a retrievable device, so we, we are more confident. Mm. So gradually release, uh, gradually release. OK, stop pacing, it's teachable. Yeah. So we can <clears throat> so we say what is going on now, what is about the pressure, what is. Uh, <clears throat> so the QRS. Good angel. Uh, I do one more angel, Graham. So it's, it's around the two, right? Yeah. yeah. So two, from the non coronary side, uh, the deeper is, uh, the depth is uh, two millimeter. Yeah. Uh, from the left coronary side, looks uh, more deeper than the, this side. Yeah. It's uh, possibly four to five, right? Yeah, I think it's good. Uh, you know, the, the self, uh, self expanding device is uh, before we totally release, it's, it's now the end stage. <laughs> this uh, may be the weakness of all of the self-expanding device, mm -hmm. which is different from the non-expandable one. But uh, you regularly, when we totally release, they will make adjustment of the position spontaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, regularly, the RCA side will be down a little bit. Uh, the RCA side will be a little bit up. So it's, uh, uh, So we have to understand this is a very important. I think it will settle um, when, you, when you release it. I think- So, so what do you think? Well, we need to judge the position or should be okay. We need to, we can release. totally release the device. I, I personally think it should be okay. The only question I had going through my mind was, you know, because in this case, the annulus was also calcified besides the leaflet, you know, you, you, you brought up that issue. Do you want to make sure that you are, your depth is such that, because you really have to be very strong and expand the, the annulus, whether you should be a tiny bit deeper, but, but I think, it, you know, I, I think, uh, so that's the only thing that came through my mind uh, because you brought up the issue of even the annulus being calcified, you know, but I think uh, otherwise, uh, yes. I, I think it's, it, it'll probably settle. That's I agree with you, Dr. Marka, but the looks, uh, it's, uh, it's okay, looks, it's yeah. only uh, I think two, it looks okay. two uh, millimeter lower. So uh, because we, we already uh, have a downsize, we select a downsize device. So it's, uh, it's uh, actually, it's, uh, what, th this is also uh, maybe one reason why we need to have a downsize for these kind of patients, especially for this uh, uh, patient with severe calcification by V case. Yeah. I think that you know, if you're from the bottom of the calcified, Point you can say is a two millimeter, right? Yeah. From the non coronary Yes. Yeah. Sinus. Okay. Okay. So uh, I, I think we we can we can release. 
I just uh, yeah. Uh, we we did a I, I just a little bit even I just a little bit push but you just confirm. Mm. Okay. Yes, I, I think it's a confirm. You want one more confirm? Uh, uh, so the position is quite stable. Yeah. So now so we, will you will you pull your wire back a little bit and lean on the system a little bit, or you want? Are you just going to just uh, keep it? Uh, 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 just so that. Uh, just know. leave the wire there. Uh, you know that when you sometimes when you push your product, the wire may may change the. Okay. But regularly okay. not. Okay. But usually not. Uh, I I just for the first operator, it's better to push the the okay. device a little bit uh, yeah. a little bit mm -hmm. forward. So uh, like the release releasing is more smoothly. What you want it? But not okay. don't push too much. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, Oh, for this kind of patient, if especially when you select a too big size, because we have a uh, we, it's an RCT study. So for some patient, uh, they uh, enrolled for the annular size, mm -hmm. uh, annular sizing strategy group. A uh, quite common phenomenon we see mm -hmm. the device moving move to into the left ventricle more. It's because of the squeezing of the mm -hmm. uh, of the calcified uh, native leaflets. So now we pull the system back. Mm -hmm. The position looks, is quite stable. Yes, it looks good. OK, <laughs> because it's a very challenging case. Yeah, should we so, do post dilatation or not? <laughs> uh, what, what is uh, uh, your uh, comment about uh, on the post dilatation? Do you think we need to do the post dilatation for the patient or not? I, yeah. I would do an echo or uh, at least an aortic root angio mm -hmm. before I make that decision. Yeah, yeah. And I would yeah. also wait. Typically, for a, it, you know, it seems to me that this valve has a lot of radial strength. So I think I would wait for a few minutes, maybe five minutes or something like that before. <clears throat> okay, so the say the echo first. Right, Tata. Okay. Uh, echo. Echo. So, 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 yeah, so usually in Asa Medical Center is a major, the simultaneous major every time the LV pressure. There is no yeah. pressure gradient and they usually leave it alone. We, we don't do uh, further dilation. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you, uh, DW. You know, the, if we want to, uh, we measure the pressure gradient, we have to mm -hmm. put the p in, pull back the wire. Mm -hmm. So we need yeah. uh, one step of the uh, manipulation. So we. Mm -hmm. It's an echo, is, uh, uh, echo is also fine, but we, now we get the, get the pigtail in to measure the pressure grading. Okay. Uh, Dr. Wang, I'm Dr. Lin from Taiwan. I um, know, I'm Dr. Lin. Yeah, uh, maybe I would switch to another projection, a little bit RIO, uh, RIO cranial to see what about the, is there any external compression uh, of the valve by the uh, uh, classification? I think yeah. this will maybe can direct, uh, help us to decide whether to post dilatation. Yes, I agree with uh, uh, your idea. It's, a, it's also uh, we we do the we see the device from different uh, angle, uh, different projection to see uh, whether the device is compressible or not. It's a regular way. We do that. That's How, the way we do that. Yeah, we check. We change the projection from mm. the because you know this patient is fusion from the right coronary and non coronary. Yeah, so this is the projection. Yeah, and then we yes, overlap. That's fine. We overlap the right coronary and non coronary. Yeah. I think this is the severe waste that we can see right here from this projection. Okay, overlap is not so precise. Uh, sometimes I will uh, uh, combine with uh, pressure tracing to see yeah. where the have a, a, a residual okay. pressure gradient. Yeah. Also, see, yes. Yeah. Yep. So uh, you know the yeah, if we do the echo, we can save one step of uh, manipulation. You know, we just leave the wire that if we see the pressure gradient, we just get the balloon in to do the post dilatation. And uh, now we are. It's, it's a fine. It's a fine. Zero. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because we, uh, we we try to simplify the timer procedure, so yeah. regularly we 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 don't do the T. It's a little bit uh, yeah. education. You can see that from the so, five o'clock, a little bit. Not so, that, no. uh, you know, I think we a lot of us have moved away from anesthesia yeah, and T. I think. You know, in some of these difficult bicuspid it's cases, like, it's, 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 it's reasonable. Like, you know, if you want to use DE, I think it's, it's okay. You know, I think in, in some of these difficult so, bicuspid uh, cases. Yes, 
Uh, I will maybe after the post dilatation, the the residual regurgitation will be decreased significantly, or even disappear, or maybe disappear. Not not much regurgitation. So now we are measure the 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 output speed. Mm. We we still do hemodynamic routinely, and one of the purpose would be if let's say the echo showed like a, a questionable um, or borderline degree of paravalvular leak, sometimes hemodynamic would kind of help, you know, calculating the regurgitated refraction. Um, just another uh, parameter to decide whether you want to go for post dilatation or not. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. Can you tell us what the diastolic pressure was when we first started? Uh, I, I try to share, I will sh share with you the hemodynamic screen. Can you say that? Yeah, we see. Uh -huh. So right now the diastolic pressure is uh, 56, 8, whatever, you know, I was seeing, yeah? Yeah. Yes, the peripheral. Uh, uh, I'm curious, what was it before? About 140, 55. Okay. Yeah. But you can see the pressure gradient now is uh, decreased from the 130, 140 to 140 12. To, to 12. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we still need a post yeah. I prefer to post yeah. post okay. mm -hmm. So happy to decide of Berlin. Do you uh, are you favor for post dilatation? Happy to decide of Berlin. You usually use the mean diameter derived from the parameter. Uh, and need, need some change uh, post dilatation Berlin. I see, yeah. Uh, uh, X1, X1 the function. design of the Venus A valve, a 23 valve, and the waist, the waist is about 19. So I think uh, 18 balloon is too small for this patient. Mm -hmm. We'd like to use 20. 20, but uh, you cannot use too big a balloon, otherwise, it will damage the device. Because for the, let us say 20, the waist of uh, the maximum weight, waist will be the 19, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we use a 20, should be okay. Yes. We cannot use the bigger than 20 for the post dilatation. <clears throat> so you're using the, what type of a balloon is this? Semi compliant? What type of? New mat. New mat. Okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So for our RCT study, so yeah. we just uh, use Z mat. Everyone yeah. is the same. Yeah. We use a uniform. Uh, mm -hmm. We uniform mm -hmm. the, the balloon. Yeah, pre balloon and post balloon is Z mat. Yes. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Should yes. be clear. Uh, right. The patient's uh, QR, QRS complex is uh, quite good. It's a, it's a narrow, very narrow. Yes. So uh, yeah, stop, uh, stop pacing. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this was a 20 balloon, Dr. Wang? Yes, 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 it's a 20 balloon. Because normally, the, yeah, mm -hmm. normally the practice, uh, what we follow is that uh, if we have done a pre-dilatation with a 20, because I think you pre-dilated with a 20, and then you are using a 23 uh, valve, and there is a residual uh, you know, leak which you are trying to seal, it may be a reasonable idea to go with maybe a 22 or something like that. And that's what we would do. But nevertheless, your protocol Whatever you uh, yes, uh, yeah. because of the, the patient's uh, annular size is uh, small. Also, we downsize, we put a, a little bit of small uh, device, so we cannot use the bigger big size of balloon for the post dilatation. Thank you, thanks, Dr. This valve seems to be like a, a hydra valve, which Dr. Vasin, I think, may be aware of, which has been developed in Thailand and then we are using in India also, which is okay. a self expanding valve and uh, has three markers like this. Uh, yes, I, 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 I think the Venus A plus the radio force is uh, a little bit stronger than the uh, radio force of a rev, uh, Evolver, right? Yeah, yeah much stronger. Yeah, Hydra uh, has much, a, much stronger the radio force. Right, Hydra has a less less of a strong. Yeah, Hydra has less uh, radial force than than the yeah, Evolver. A pressure grading, yali hai mein chalaa they are now doing zero check. Uh, now they finish zero check. Yeah, much better. Uh, much better. You can say uh, 
可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可可你扫，那反正还是主动本来还是，而且慢了。多。嗯、uh, ，Yes, I think it improved, uh, improved after post validation. <coughs> But you know the the patient has so severe calcification native leaf. It's an uh, yeah. previous yeah. Uh, pressure grading is one hundred forty. Yes. So <coughs> I think it's acceptable. About a ten. Nine. 10 to 10 to 11, 10 to 11. Um, so um, do you, I, I'm sure, you know, we see this with self-expanding valves, uh, you know, you may have some AI and then the falling date sort of gets better because the valve continues to expand as long as you think you're actually uh, positioned well, you know what I'm saying? So uh, what, are you planning to do uh, uh, another aortic root chart, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Wang? Um, to take a look? Yes, we're going to do the, the other yeah. angiogram yes. to see whether the, 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 yes. what is the final uh, injection? Regularly we do the final yeah. angiogram in order to see how much uh, AR is still there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but for this patient, I don't think that he need a uh, wire wire. So we just uh, pull back the, the pigtail is uh, more precisely to evaluate the AR. No. Okay. Okay. So, you have all prepared? All prepared. Everything is ready. Yes, everything is ready. Okay. Uh, yes, I think that this is good. Yes. There is some AI, but I think I, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think you. There is no point of, uh, as you mentioned, that you cannot use a bigger balloon with this valve because of the, yes. right? Yes. So I think that's uh, that you 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 you're concerned about. So I think with time, maybe the lower part will uh, expand a little bit more. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So I think. No, so we have seen very frequently that in self-expanding valves, these kind of AIs might even get better in two three days time. Yeah, that's exactly what I said earlier. So yeah. I think that there is, you, you know. The, the AI, I would say, you know, when you do angiography, it always, always looks a lot worse, I have to say. Uh, uh, and, and your injection was powerful, you know, you were not hesitating. In, uh, so it's a, it's a very true injection of, uh, you know, with a lot of contrast. So I think that uh, there's no gradient here. There is, uh, in, in my assessment, maybe mild kind of alveolar aortic regurgitation. And I think that this patient will do, you know, this patient is just going to do well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I would just wait and see what happens to the AI. I think it'll be interesting to see, and I will not be surprised if it actually. Yeah, happens. yeah, yeah. So you know, because of the severe calcification in the annulus and in the AVOT, yeah, you, we can see right here. So just in the left coronary side. So I think for this patient, it's impossible. Yeah, for there's no regurgitation, no PVL for this patient. I agree with you. So. Yeah. so in most of the <clears throat> clinical studies, you regularly, most of, uh, of these kind of patients will be excluded. So until now, we, we don't have much uh, yeah. evidence <laughs> to yeah. support uh, for these kind of patients. So yeah. I said, ask that this is also the other purpose of uh, Hanzo Solution RCT studies. Yeah. To say, okay, you, I mean, you can see this is the, the previous, uh, before, we, before the procedure, yeah, it's, uh, the patient even has uh, more significant yeah, PVL. I think it improved. Yeah, after the procedure. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Wang, yeah. Professor Wang, uh, I think I think for the, the such uh, heavily calcified by calcium valve, I I don't think I would need to push push the this valve too much to the limit because we should kind of balance between the any rupture and the PVL. So I think the 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 the, uh, the result uh, is that acceptable. So I think for me, I will stop start the procedure here. Actually, uh, for this kind of patient, even we put a big size uh, device, may, may not have less PBR. We, this is from our cohort studies. Mm -hmm. but we, we hopefully we get the answer from the RCT study. 
Uh, I don't think uh, you regularly when you put a big device, usually because of the squeezing force to mold the device, cause the device diving to the to the left ventricle, even maybe have more significant PVR. So, mm -hmm. so we, we, because it's an RCT study, I think we can get the conclusion whether big size is, uh, annular size is decrease or increase the PVR mm -hmm. compared with the super also, 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 you know, if you show the baseline angiogram again, this one that was playing, can you, um, can you, can uh, you please, because there was some AI to start. And when you have baseline aortic regurgitation, Yes, so this is a baseline. Okay. So uh, yes, yeah. the baseline. So when you have baseline aortic regurgitation, the impact of post procedure aortic regurgitation on outcomes is diminished. Okay, I think we should always try to get less. But what I'm trying to say here is that this patient had PV, you know, valvular regurgitation. So there are some studies that have shown that in those patients, the impact on survival of you know, um, uh, you know, PV leak is actually less. So I think because of multiple reasons, I personally think that the result is acceptable. And, uh, you know, this was not an easy case. It's actually a very difficult case. Uh, the fact that you did not need a pacemaker, the QRS did not widen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always a balance, right? Between PV leak and pacemaker, yeah. uh, you're always trying to strike a balance. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, this patient will benefit clinically uh, from this procedure, and I think we should. It'll be interesting to see what happens to people at that time. Exactly. Yeah, so, uh, Mr. Wang, hi. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, I fully agree that this case is acceptable. But how about if after the twenty millimeter balloon, uh, twenty uh, millimeter balloon uh, post dilatation, there's still moderate degree of PBL. What is your bailout plan for that? Are you allowed to put in a second valve for because we cannot upsize the balloon. So what is <laughs> our bailout plan? Uh, if the regurgitation is uh, moderate, uh, or even bigger than moderate, we, we will consider the valve in valve. Uh, mm -hmm. we, but you, you, cannot, you cannot select the bigger balloon to, to do the post dilatation because you may damage the, 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 the device. So we, we can maybe we, we can pull the valve in valve, but we need, still need to do the analysis uh, because sometimes because of the too severe calcification, protrusion cause the cause the regurgitation. Even you put the valve in valve may may not solve the problem. Uh, but actually, uh, when you you when you put the second valve, you absolutely you will have more chance to decrease the PVR because of the. Uh, Different uh, when you put a second one is not so maybe you you load it a little bit so you you have a you, you will cover more the uh, the 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 regurgitated jet uh, in big mm -hmm. uh, bigger area so may may decrease the may have a chance to decrease the PVR mm -hmm. yeah sometimes we can we can see from the echo so if the the, the regurgitation because of the bulky calcification so maybe the occluder. Yeah, so mm. PVL occlusion will be helpful for this kind of patient. Yeah. So, so I was going to mention that that I think I what the way I would deal with this is uh, you know I would I would follow this patient and I think it's going to be the same or less, but for whatever reason, if you were bothered by the PV leak, you could consider bringing this patient back, and under TE guidance, actually try to put uh, one of those AVP two plugs. You know, so we've done some cases like that, uh, and I that. You know that might take care of the situation because that you know the valve in valve or putting another valve has it works but then it has its own limitations right in terms of coronary access and other things so so i would attempt a plug in in a patient where it was necessary i would probably attempt a plug first i don't think I you're going to need that in yeah, really calcified valves raj uh, uh, i have tried a few times valve and valve but it doesn't work because what happens is that there is a space between the calcific chunk and the rim of the valve, and it will be absolutely impossible. Even if you put three valves, it is not going to seal, as you said already. So putting a device closure is the only best option, or else one can do a gentle dilatation. Sometimes mm -hmm. it can help. Otherwise, I think you know one has to accept in this kind of anatomy and not risk the rupture of the annulus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, very nice. Now we move to the next cath lab to to do a a warm uh, left demo uh, on the on the match valve uh, the regurgitation case. So we we use a new device 
Uh, it's still on clinical study, it's a dragonfly. Yes. So now we move to the next room. Okay, okay. good. Perfect. Okay, okay. 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 thank you, Dr. Wei. This was an excellent case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as we are moving to the other lab, I think one comment which was made by Dr. Wang was about the diving of the valve. It very commonly happens when the valve is oversized, especially in bicuspid mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, people starting the second case, I have one question to Dr. Rajamak and uh, uh, such like a very severe catch by the bicuspid aortic valve and the Dr. Wang shows the a very nice result with the, uh, the you know, uh, self-expandable. So when you decided to the balloon expandable type, so what is the sizing strategy for such a very severe calcified region? Yeah, I mean, we go by annular sizing. Uh, it would be a little bit conservative. I would probably take a CC or two out rather than downsize by a size. Mm -hmm. I would just size by the annulus, but actually take a little bit of volume out of it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you're feeling it. And mm -hmm. I have now occasionally deployed these valves in two stages. Mm -hmm. So you go up, deploy it so that you have stuck you reach six atmospheres, you don't mm -hmm. go up, and you come down, and then you go up again. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you expand it out fully. So, uh, you know, the person who's expanding the inflation device is a very important person mm -hmm. when, when you're doing this bypass mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Liu and Dr. Wang. Hi. Okay, can uh, you introduce this case? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Liu, please introduce the case. Okay. Okay, please share the slides for me. Okay, the patient is a 64 years old lady and the patient has a recurrent exertional dyspnea for six months. And the patient also has a history of the COPD. And next one. And the patient is very thin and short. So the BMI is about less than seven, 17 kilogram per uh, meter square, and the STS score about 6%. And the cautery is good for this patient. Next one. <clears throat> and from the TTE, we can see the patient has a prolapse, of the P2 prolapse. The severe, severity of the MR is about grade three to grade four. <laughs> Next one. And this is the TEE screening uh, images right here. Mm -hmm. And the Y is about 12 millimeter and the gap is about three millimeter. Mm -hmm. Next one. And this is the report from the echo call lab. And next one. So we will use the Dragonfly test system. This is the edge to edge repair system for this patient with the TEE guidance and we will use general anesthesia and we will plan just a long and wide dragonfly system for this patient. Next one. So you just- uh, yeah, you, you Keep okay. on going, keep on going. So, you know, because much clip is the very typical edge to edge repair system and the evidence is very good. And the dragonfly is a domestic made from the Dejin company. And the, I think the, the, the design is, is similar. However, there are some innovations. So we can see, see right here, there's a filter in the middle and they have the independent leaflet capture capacity and the four different sizes. And uh, there's adjustable closing angles. And we can see right here, the clip, the Dragonfly delivery system right here. The uh, big difference is uh, Dragonfly has the filler instead of the so spacer. So you can see the device? Mm. The filler instead of the spacer. Kind no, the filler is, uh, can be uh, compressible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, <coughs> you can adjust, uh, nice. make the closing angle. Uh, uh, can, you can adjust, adjust the closing angle of the arm. So... Uh, <coughs> Uh, the patient, we are uh, we already done the transeptal, so we put the big sheets in. Uh, the outside is the the bigger guiding. Uh, the the guide uh, is the big guide. Uh, there are one controller. So when is uh, uh, you can control the anterior, uh, posterior, and uh, can control the direction of the media and the lateral. So mm -hmm. this is a one handle. 
uh, can control the four directions. Then there are middle sheets in, middle sheets is here. So now we try to uh, get the middle sheets with the clipping, with the dragonfly clipping. Dr. Wang, I'm Cole from Assam Medical Center. What side did you choose today, today's case? Uh, you mean, so how big the size of the dragonfly clip? Yes, today's case. Uh, we regularly for this kind of patient, we select the- Long and wide. The, the, long, the long and the wide one. It's yeah. uh, 12, 12 and, 12 and uh, six. Mm -hmm. Thank 12 you. In, 12 in length and mm -hmm. uh, six in width. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we, uh, mechanically, the manipulation is, uh, I think the, it's, uh, uh, the system is very good. Uh, the system is, uh, is uh, quite different from the metric clip. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like, uh, uh, <clears throat> so easy. Are you able to elongate this, uh, just like, the, you know, the Pascal, uh, you know, the, one of the features of Pascal is that you don't get entangled or you can get disentangled uh, if you want to by elongating the system. Um, is that uh, a feature of this as well or no? Uh, or is it more like a clip? Yeah, so I think as far as delivery uh, system, it's uh, more, more like, like the, the Pisco maybe. More like the clip. Oh, more like the clip, yeah. <laughs> you know, I never tried the Pisco. Yeah. Uh, guiding how much depth in the... What's that? Tweet, yeah. I can tweet, yeah. I can tweet. Now I withdraw the bigger guide. Uh, almost the ones. Okay, okay, yeah. okay so okay. Yeah. I just get the. Uh, then you don't know. You know the different from the uh, the magic clip. Magic mm -hmm. clip. Firstly, you need to achieve the straddle. Then mm -hmm. you can bend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, for the dragonflies, uh, uh, just when you uh, not not so strict. Uh, even even like the patient, we have not uh, achieved the. The straddle probably still can can do a little bit bad. So, it. mm -hmm. so it's good for the patient with a, a small uh, left leg HM, not so big left leg HM. should be fine. The manipulator will be more easy. So how are you? So you have the M knob there, right? Do you, you do, so? Yeah. So we have to the you know the uh, the two handles. Yeah. Uh, one for the bigger guy, one for the middle sheets. Mm -hmm. So four four bolts have four directions. Medial, medial lateral and anterior, posterior. So. Okay. Good. Yes. Okay. Uh, so it's a lateral looks like we need more, we, we need more medial, right? Yeah. Or bring the whole, how do you, you can bring the whole system back because you don't want to change. Yes, uh, you know, the, the, in the, uh, for the metric clip, we need to uh, move the stabilizer. But uh, for the dragonfly, you don't need to move the stabilizer. You just move the, move the handle, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I just mow back the, because I have too much straddle, I just mow back the middle sheets. Uh, <clears throat> we still need to uh, maybe a little bit more media to achieve the little bit more media. Come on. Gotcha. Oh. Yeah. Also, we can <coughs> we can let the ventilation ventilator to to, to decrease the tidal volume. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I think more more actually. You need to make sure it's good. So you have a little bit of a aorta hugger, yeah. Uh, not much. I can I can make I can uh, <clears throat> I can make adjustments. That's, that's I can right. let the let the let the bigger guy to more posterior. Yeah. Okay. I can more posterior. We can decrease the hugging. Hugging <coughs> should be better. M M We can have more M on the big. On the bigger guide, so we can solve the high gain problem. But mm -hmm. the, actually, the puncture side, transceptor puncture side, is a very posterior. 
So, Dr. Wang, in terms of uh, the use usability of this device, is it anything very different from the Mitro Clip, or uh, is it similar in terms of uh, maneuvering and also you know positioning? And uh, I think it's a, a much big difference. You know the um, Mitro Clip, and uh, which is a uh, when we make adjustment of posterior or anterior, we have only one handle to 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 make just uh, right to mm -hmm. make adjustment anterior or posterior. But uh, for the dragonfly system, you have two handles. You have one the, for the bigger guide, one for the middle sheath. You so you can try to uh, not just depending on one handle, but you can okay. you can depending on the two handles, you can make make a difference. Uh, sometimes you just change the middle sheath, uh, but sometimes you can change the bigger sheath. Mm -hmm. Try to integrate yeah. the, the the manipulation. So shall we check the trajectory? Now we do you think we need more trajectory to do to do the trajectory now? Okay. Uh, you can go now. Oh, now. So now we do a trajectory. So what do you think? The trajectory. Um, okay. A little bit. Uh, move forward to the. Should be okay. To posterior. You didn't deal. A little bit anterior. Okay. Or more. What do you think? Point to the yeah. apex, right? Uh, okay. Okay, I think it should be fine, but that's still, uh, we, maybe we can decrease the tight volume. So now we open the uh, open the clip. Uh, looks like we, we, we say the 3D and fast okay. to say whether we need to uh, change the orientation. I think the orientation is not good. Yes, so I think we need to fix the orientation. You can also see that proscopically. Okay. Now we, uh, now we are seeing the, so, uh, so we, we need a clockwise rotation. Yeah. And do the clockwise rotation. Yes. Okay, try to change the orientation, yeah. correct the orientation. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's okay. Maybe we cool. need more anterior. We need, uh, I, I think you're getting there. So I, think it's I think we are getting yeah. there. Two media. Maybe uh, yeah. still, you, you think it's a two media? I don't think so. Yeah. I think yeah. The, I look it's good right now. I think it's good. Uh, yes. Maybe a little bit more lateral. Okay, change the, we need to change the projection of X-ray to, to have a good, projection. So we let the two arms overlap so we can make judgment of whether the orientation is changed or not. Okay, so what, what do you think? Uh, I think um, maybe we need more anterior? Yeah. A little bit more, a, a little bit of anterior. Should be fine. Yeah. So now we can move. Color is on, please. Yeah. yeah more media? We need more media? Yeah, this is the right position. Hmm. Okay. Going down. We are moving. March view. Okay. Do you check the position of the grippers like we would normally do? Uh, do you have grippers in the system? Yes. So yes. that you would know what is what, uh, and then if you decide to do uh, later on some mm. independent capture, you are ready with that. Yeah. yeah I so, think the grippers, you can actually see the uh, serrated appearance of those grippers on the posterior side. Yeah, we already tested it in the in control. Tested. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so we, yeah, we can just uh, go ahead. Okay. Yes. No, the position looks fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we just I think, yeah, I think you can probably enter now. Yeah. Uh, similar to the clip, it's uh, very easy to change the orientation when you're yeah. going down to the ventricle. Good, so, good. So we have to... Okay, good. Good. Okay, now it's okay. 
。OK 啦。So、from the Uh, looks like the orientation is. I'll、uh, explain. Better. Better. But from the X-ray, looks like a little bit the orientation has a little change. The orientation has been changed. Okay, okay. 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 Yeah, it's nice you actually have both. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I just uh, I just yeah, release a little bit tension. Yes. Then just closing, more release the tension. Good. Uh, we we don't need to、okay. because uh the in the middle is a filler, not the spacer. 还是有点分流，对吧？分流呢 ？We need more. Maybe we need more the. So you have a jet, a small jet on the lateral side, very small, and the there is also a small jet on the on, on the medial side. <laughs> so maybe we need to. So I think you should. Uh, the question that you must ask is: Are you going to need two clips, and should you move this in one direction so that you can put the other? Yes.、Uh, I mean, you, your your severity of MR has gone down, but the question is: Are you going to be happy leaving jets on small jets on both sides? So, what is your comment?、Uh, we move the clip more medial, maybe one more clip on in the ladder, or we just、yeah. uh, we can accept the result or not. I would be tempted to move this,、um, you know, because it's degenerative disease and it will continue to、uh, probably progress. The I would also be guided by the gradient. Yeah, so I think that gradient. Yeah, so I think、mm. what is your gradient? Uh, 看看压差 I think the gradient should be drop. 对，再方向看看啊 Before is how much? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be high because I didn't see any flow acceleration. Yeah, so we can check the the pressure gradient now. 压差是多少？压差，看一下压差。那个方向也还可以。I think the orientation should be should be okay. Yes, good. Should be good. Just a small small jet,、mm -hmm. but also from the media. Okay.、Uh, yes. Actually, it doesn't look all that bad here, you know. So. Yeah, we can move a little bit to a little more media. But if we move、mm -hmm. more media, maybe we we need a one more clip. Yeah. In the, so we can the check、lateral. the gradient.、Mm. Should be fine. Should be fine.、Huh? I think possibly two, right? Yeah, the the orifice、uh, of the much of valve is about six point five centimeter.、Mm. Yeah, it's a big valve. Okay, that、yeah, is big. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask our other uh, colleagues um, if they have any other comments.、Uh, you know, would they accept this? Would they try to make this better? Because three, three, three. The main, the main part、uh, is three. So, <clears throat> Dr. Raj, I think you know this looks. Visually, it looks quite all right. Yeah. To leave this behind and not putting a second clip, but certainly, you know, gradient is something you know which is also a guiding force, as you already said. That if the gradient is、uh, creeping up a little bit, and then it may, it may be difficult to put a second one. But definitely, it doesn't require a second. Alia. It is looking so nice with the. I'm okay. Two more days, hope, ah, okay. And we can see from the echo that there's a little bit prolapse from the posterior. So maybe we can grasp so, more. Yeah, maybe maybe what you can do is you can optimize it. Yeah. yeah so yeah, maybe try to if you move the whole system posterior and then you、yeah. raise the gripper and so you know. Yeah. Maybe that would be. Yeah, I cut it down. This one gripper is gone. Gripper is gone. Yeah, yeah, I know. Gripper is gone. Yes, already. Good, good. So and the Dr. Wang and the、uh, Dr. Raj and we have、uh, some limited time and we will have、uh, one lecture from. Uh, Dr. Zhang Min An, and then we will check it out final result. Is it okay? Oh, okay, okay, it's fine. Okay, okay, great. Okay, okay. So and、uh, we we have a、uh, one lecture at this okay, time. Okay. Uh, so and the、uh, the I'm gonna move to the Dr. An, and you can you give a lecture, and then we will uh end the lecture. We will check it out the final result.
First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, congratulations to Dr. Wang, the nice result of uh, Top of 4 by Custom AES using Venus Bell. My topic is Top of 4 by Custom AES. So first, uh, first, uh, first event tower was done in bicuspid R twelve. So the bicuspid R twelve is very common. So this is the pathology data from the uh, William Robert. So age eighty one to ninety bicuspid R twelve is only twenty eight percent, but the seventy one to eighty bicuspid R twelve is forty two, but the sixty one to seventy bicuspid R twelve is sixty uh, percent. So nowadays the tower age is down to the 65 or so, you have to manage more bicuspid aortic valve uh, populations. So we, we, we have to know the, how to deal with the bicuspid AES by, uh, by the TAVA procedure. But uh, as you know, there are many concerns of bicuspid AES TAVA, the anatomical concern, procedural concerns. So this is the case of 70, uh, 79 men with bicuspid AES. The practical issue would be the, is it feasible by tower? Which type would be better than the other? How to select the optimal size? Pre and post balloon is necessary. If there is a device under expansion, how to deal with and how to deal with the associated autopathy. So I summarized the, the 18 studies so far. So to compare the bicuspid and tricuspid tower population. Regarding the heart end point death and stroke, there is no difference, but uh, some complication, particularly by uh, probable leakage and aortic valve injury is higher in patient with the aortic valve treated by TAVR. So STSAC TAVR registry demonstrated that there is no difference regarding heart end point in SAPN3, the large marker data, the evolute R. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a note that uh, randomized trial to compare the balloon expandable and uh, self-expandable device, but Raji Makara demonstrated that there is no difference regarding two-year mortality after TAVR uh, between the bicuspid AES and tricuspid AES, but the characteristics of complication is different. Balloon expandable device is associated with a higher risk of outer root injury and self expandable valve is associated with a higher risk of private water leakage. Uh, another issue is how to select the valve sizing. The, so far, many sizing, sizing category algorithm. So I, I think this, this finding is very important. The data from Barbara Registry, they evaluated the configuration of aortic valve complex. They defined the three types of aortic valve complex, tubular type, layer type, taper type. Tubular type, defined as the annulus diameter is equal to the intercommissural distance. Layer type is uh, annulus diameter is smaller than intercommissural distance. Taper type is uh, annulus is larger than intercommissural distance. So most uh, patients with developed disease is uh, belong to the tubular or layer type. So, the, so we, we can guess that uh, we can decide device sizing based on the annulus size. So the, this is a devi uh, device uh, device sizing so far. I think based on the previous finding, the Sapien 3 balloon expandable device sizing is relatively simple. Uh, in our uh, as a medical centers, we usually mostly depend on the annulus sizing, but very importantly, don't do oversizing, particularly don't do device oversizing too much, less than 5% or nominal sizing is safe and effective for bicus AS patient. But uh, self-expandable device or other device, there are many devices and algorithm, but we needed to be evaluated for the future latest data or randomized trial data. Then balloon available plastic is very important. The goal of uh, three Tricuspid AS, balloon valve plasty is not uh, uh, mandatory, but I think by cusp AS, the balloon valve plasty is very important. The goal is different. The first goal is to facilitate the device delivery, to confirm device sizing, to assess the risk of coronary obstruction, to avoid the risk of RT complex injury, relatively small balloon should be selected based on the CT measurement of RT valve complex. How to do the post implantation? The, this is a evolute R implantation after uh, 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 in Picos AS. This view it looks fine, but uh, another view 
very under expect under expanded device. So sometimes we need a uh, post balloon to uh, to uh, to decrease the, the pressure gradient. But sometimes it's not uh, possible fully uh, fully to uh, overcome the very tight the bicuspid uh, artifact disease. Uh, actually, bicuspid AS is a, 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 a aortic valve disease uh, uh, associated autopathy. So, but uh, uh, there are some data. The after uh, surgical aortic valve replacement, how how much increase the the risk of dissection after surgical AVR in my pump population after surgical AVR aortic dissection risk is rapidly increasing, even though, even after the surgical AVR. But because the aortic valve disease, after surgical AVR, there is, no, there is no increase in the risk of aortic dissection. This is our center's data. The rate of aortic valve dilatation after surgical AVR, there is no difference regarding the, uh, the rate of aortic valve dilatation after stopper because between bicuspid aortic valve and tricuspid aortic valve. So this is our, suggest, uh, our suggestion that uh, if a patient has a higher surgical risk, very older population, tower would be good. Low surgical risk population, if our root and ascending our size is more than five or 5.5, depend um, with the discussion, discussing with the, the cardiothoracic surgeon, yes, surgical AVR plus our surgery would be good. No, our ascending aorta is not, not that large. We can consider the tower. So I'd like to introduce to the, the, our center's experience. Uh, 2011 to 2019, we treated 72 bicuspid aortic uh, valve disease uh, by, by TAVR, self expandable device 49, uh, balloon expandable device 49, DAPN 3, uh, 46. This is age of TAVR, uh, age of bicuspid AS population. The proportion of TAVR for bicuspid AS is uh, Function of age, younger age, higher rate, of higher instance of bicuspid AS. Uh, between the 65 to 70, uh, one out of five patients have bicuspid AS treated by the tower. The most common type is type 1, 76% of patients have type 1 bicuspid aortic valve. Yeah, uh, according to the Barbadi registry data, in our data show the similar findings, the 92% of patients. Uh, with uh, bicuspid AS, ha ha have had the tubular type or flare type. The taper type is very rare, only 8%. So this is a baseline characteristic. Patient age is younger in bicuspid AS, therefore comorbidity is less than tricuspid AS. This is a CT measurement. The most different between the bicuspid AS and tricuspid AS is all annular dimensions are larger in bicuspid AS. Most characteristic finding is uh, severe calcification in bicuspid AS. We measure the volume of calcification of our uh, bicuspid AS. The median or mean uh, calcification volume is 600. In case of tricuspid AS population, mean and median uh, calcification volume is around 300. So calcification is double in bicuspid AS. This is very important because the severe calcification in bicuspid AS is associated with the complication and higher mortality. This is procedural characteristics. pre volume valvular plus, plus is very frequent. About 90% of patients receive the pre volume valvular plus. In addition, some complication is higher numerically. Converted to surgery for 4%, and rupture one case, wire preparation one case, valvular migration is one, one patient. Annual rupture one case, the balloon expandable device. The second valve implantation, two case, core valve, self expandable device. New papers make implantation 11%. Actually, this is higher than current standard. Core valve two, Everett R2, Sapien three, three cases. Moderate to severe parabolic leakage is 16%. I think this is higher than current standard. Particularly when we use the self expandable device, the risk of parabolic leakage is higher than balloon expandable device. Well, after introduction of SAPN3, we only use the SAPN3 in patient with the bicuspid AS. 46 patient, this is a procedural outcomes. I think this is a very important. Uh, in case of tricuspid AS, the Valuable oversizing to annulus is uh, 13%. Uh, 
So between the uh, around the 15 percent is our is our goal. But by cost basis, our goal was five percent, but uh, we measured that uh, only seven percent. So we don't do oversight in case of by cost basis, considering the risk of our injury. Volume 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 is very frequent. Conversion to surgery is only one case in sapien three cohort. No coronary obstruction, no annular rupture, no second valve implantation. Pacemaker implantation is a 6.5. Severe para moderate to severe parabolic leakage is only four cases. One due to the valve migration, three due to the severe lafay calcification. Post dilatation was done the, in help of a patient. This is uh, my uh, final uh, summary. Actually, we did more experience for top of a bicus AS. Case selection is more, I think, very important. Uh, like as a medical center, we prefer the self expand uh, balloon expandable device to treat the bicus AS. We have to consider the risk of output injury. Some centers prefer, the, prefer to use the balloon uh, self expandable device. Uh, they should consider the risk of the parabellar leakage, even though tau for bicuspid AS is not associated with excess mortality. I think the selected patient with bicuspid AS would be a candidate for tau with future better devices. I'd like to say again that don't do oversight, in particular, don't do device oversight, in SAPI, particularly in SAP3. Less than 5% would be good. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Dr. Han, thank you for your very informative lecture. and. Uh, uh, so the because of time limit and uh, just one question from the panel or discussant would be okay. And any question to Dr. An's lecture? Any comment? So you know one small comment uh, and a question to uh, uh, the presenter. So basically, in the you know we saw that a lot of patients actually had more than moderate PVL. So what was the outcome in those patients and what eventually was done to these patients? to overcome this problem of uh, more than moderate PVA? Uh, personally, I think severe PVA may be associated with the mortality, but uh, moderate, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, during the procedure, there is just some moderate PVA, the particularly subpain three, I like to do the post-dilatation. But the, we have to compromise between the risk of procedure and the reduction of uh, benefit of reduction of PVL. So the particularly in case of very severe calcification, I don't like to do aggressive positive lactation. I want to wish everyone around the world good health. Uh, my task is to share with you the outcomes after TAVR in bicuspid aortic stenosis. These are my disclosures. I want to start with this classic study done in 2005, which showed that the prevalence of bicuspid valve in patients undergoing isolated aortic valve replacement is almost 50%. But if you look at some of the registries, including the United States TVT registry, the prevalence of patients who have bicuspid aortic stenosis amongst patients who have undergone TABR is not that high. It is anywhere from 3% to 7% in the most recent analysis. So the point I want to make is that TAVR is therefore being used selectively in bicuspid aortic stenosis and data should be interpreted accordingly. I want to start by this study, the, uh, uh, st this analysis that we did in 2018, uh, you know, from the US TVT registry, more than 2,700 bicuspid aortic stenosis patients with average age of 74 and a mean STS of 4.9. What we did was a propensity matched analysis uh, and essentially had almost 2,700 pairs of patients with bicuspid and tricuspid aortic stenosis. And looking at the procedural outcomes, what you can see is that the outcomes were not that bad. In fact, conversion to open surgery occurred 0.9%. It was more common than tricuspid aortic stenosis. Similarly, annulus rupture and aortic dissection and coronary obstruction were also all low, less than 1%. Um, also looking at the 30-day mortality, there was no difference between bicuspid and tricuspid aortic stenosis. The stroke rates were higher in patients who uh, underwent uh, TAVR for bicuspid, 2.4% compared to 1.6%. And similarly, the new pacemaker rates were also slightly but significantly higher uh, in patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis. 
the one-year outcomes uh, also were favorable and not different between bicuspid and uh, tricuspid aortic stenosis. You can look at one-year mortality and the one-year stroke rates. The stroke rates which were different at 30 days were actually quite similar at one year between bicuspid and tricuspid. Now, the analysis that I just presented to you was with the balloon expandable um, or the Sapien 3 platform. Similar data also exists uh, in, the, in the TVT registry with the use of the Evolutar and Pro uh, valves. Once again, the average age was 73, STS 5.3, and if you look at the 30-day death rates, they were 2.6% versus 1.7%, and the stroke rates were 3.4 versus 2.7%. The paravalvular leak rates, as you can actually see here, you know, uh, in, in this particular analysis, were 30% a little bit higher compared to patients with bicuspid aortic uh, stenosis. A more recent analysis from the same registry. So now, uh, after the approval of the low-risk TAVR in the United States, what we were interested in seeing was what are the outcomes of TAVR in patients who are low-risk for surgery, defined as STS score less than 3%. So there, are, there were almost um, 37,000 patients who were low-risk um, for uh, a surgery and underwent a Sapien 3 or Sapien 3 ultra valve implantation between uh, June 2015 and October 2020. Um, uh, uh, more than 3,200 of these patients were actually bicuspid, so we had almost um, 3,100 plus patients, uh, pairs of bicuspid and tricuspid aortic stenosis, which allowed us to do a propensity matching, uh, looking at essentially death and stroke, and also looking at a number of other secondary endpoints, including procedural complications, echo, uh, uh, cardiographic outcomes, as well as functional status outcomes. So this is the baseline characteristics. The age was 68.8 uh, in both groups. The STS score was 1.7. And the other um, uh, things listed here were not significantly different as well in the uh, patients with bicuspid and tricuspid. So I think this is the important slide. Look at this. Conversion to open heart surgery occurred 1.4% of the times. It was the same in tricuspid aortic stenosis. Annular rupture, 0.2%. Cardiopulmonary bypass, 0.5%. Aortic dissection, 0.1%. Coronary obstruction, 0.3%. All right, so I think 0.03%. Uh, uh, so uh, these are excellent outcomes when you look at the, um, you know, the uh, uh, outcomes and compare them to the tricuspid, or you compare them even to the contemporary uh, surgical series uh, in patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis. So look at the 30-day mortality. It was less than 1%, 0.9%. And if you look at the tricuspid, it's the same, 0.8%. Similarly, the stroke rates were also similar. If you look at the outcomes all the way up to one year, once again, what you will see here is, in fact, there was no difference. Or if anything, patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis uh, had lower mortality. You know, it almost reached statistical significance, 4.6% compared to 6.6%. Um, uh, and then the stroke rates were actually also similar between bicuspid and tricuspid aortic stenosis. If you look at some of the other outcomes here, there was... Uh, a trend towards higher pacemaker rates, it's slightly higher, but it actually did not turn out to be significant in terms of p-values. And similarly, aortic valve reintervention was more common in patients with uh, uh, bicuspid aortic stenosis. But look at the numbers. It was 1.1% uh, compared to 0.4%. So I think that, that these are excellent data. And similarly, there was no difference in any readmissions uh, between bicuspid and tricuspid aortic stenosis patients all the way up to looking at the aortic valve gradients and valve areas. They were actually similar. And looking at the paravalvular regurgitation rates, uh, they are slightly higher uh, in patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis. You know, at 30 days, the numbers were 1.8%, moderate or severe. These numbers go up to 3.5% uh, compared to 2.1% at one year. So, I, I, you know, these are very acceptable uh, numbers. If you look at the NYHA class and KCCQ scores, they, are, uh, they significantly improve both in bicuspid and tricuspid patients, and the numbers were actually uh, not different between the two groups. Uh, and this is looking at the overall cohort. So look at the entire patients, irrespective of the STS score in the most recent analysis. So these are almost 7,000 patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis, you know, so 7,000 uh, pairs. And look at the uh, death rates and look at the stroke rates. Once again, reassuring that the bicuspid outcomes were not worse compared to tricuspid outcomes. 
Now, there are more uh, data that come from the Partner 3 registry, which enroll patients from more than 30 centers, uh, you know, less than a STS score of uh, four, and the key exclusion was hostile anatomy and aortic dimensions more than 40. So there were 237 patients enrolled, uh, uh, presented in, on the committee calls and 170 were enrolled. So this is the schematic essentially um, uh, looking at this. So you have, uh, you know, once again, what was done here was propensity matching with the patients who underwent uh, by cuspid uh, or, or um, um, uh, uh, TAVR for tricuspid aortic stenosis in the low risk study here. So looking at the comparative outcomes between bicuspid and tricuspid aortic stenosis, and if you look at this, the death rate was 0% at 30 days and 0.7% in bicuspid at one day. So these are very good and acceptable outcomes. And of course, not different compared to the tricuspid aortic stenosis. And these are the rehospitalization rates, once again, not, uh, not very different. These are the paravalvular regurgitation rates. Uh, you know, um, they are not different compared to the tricuspid aortic stenosis. Uh, and if you look at the number of patients with, uh, uh, you know, there is no patient here with the, or with more than moderate aortic regurgitation. Uh, so these are, of course, carefully selected patients, um, but nonetheless, same uh, theme is repeated. Similar data are also there for evolute low risk and similar analysis was done also comparing their patients with the uh, tricuspid aortic stenosis patients done, the, done in the pivotal low risk evolute trial. And once again, if you look at the outcomes here, death or disabling stroke, uh, <clears throat> very, very uh, favorable. So um, the 1.4% uh, uh, combined endpoint mortality was 0.7%. And if you look at the one-year outcomes as well, you know, in bicuspid patient, uh, mortality rate, rate of 0.7% and disabling stroke, uh, stroke rate of 0.7% are excellent data. The pacemaker rates were about 16-17%, uh, which uh, I think, uh, you know, are also um, reasonable with the self-expanding uh, platform. The, uh, the valve hemodynamics were indeed excellent. Look at the valve areas here, all the way up to one year. I think they are very, very uh, and if you look at the paravalvular regurgitation rates, uh, once again, um, uh, you can see that uh, there were no differences uh, here uh, in terms of, uh, if anything, the, the rates of mild uh, AR was actually um, higher in patients with tricuspid aortic stenosis. So I'm a little bit puzzled by that, but those are the data at least um, suggesting that there were no um, uh, issues in terms of paravalvular regurgitation patients with um, uh, bicuspid aortic stenosis. Uh, I would like to also talk a little bit about this study that uh, my colleague um, Sanghan put together, um, you know, and what we did here was uh, we analyzed more than a thousand CTs, um, uh, you know, in patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the details are uh, listed here of the types of valves, but mostly it was uh, a lot of uh, sapient three balloon expandable. And, um, you know, in the minority of patients, um, uh, the Evolute, uh, uh, PRO was used about 18% uh, of the times, and if you look at the mortality at 30 days, it was 2%, stroke rate was 2.4%, but, um, you know, these patients had a higher STS score. These were all comers. This was a primarily a study of uh, high-risk and intermediate-risk patients, so 3.7 was the um, STS score. And what we found was that conversion, to, when you had a combination, we divided these patients between, um, you know, patients who had uh, calcified RAFE or excess leaflet calcium uh, or none of these or both of these features. And it is when you have a combination of both calcified RAFE and excess leaflet calcium, that is when you have more aortic root injury, as is shown here. And not only that, the 30-day mortality was also actually higher in patients um, uh, when the when the, um, uh, there was a combination of uh, excess leaflet calcium and calcified RAFA. And this is shown here in the central illustration uh, of uh, this particular uh, analysis published in JAK. And, and what I also want to point out is that at least in this data set that was sent to us from different sites, what we found was that in a quarter of a patients, 26% of these patients, there was a combination of calcified RAFA plus excess leaflet calcium. So in summary, what I would say is that um, there are favorable outcomes with TAVR in carefully selected patients with Sapien and Evolute in real-life TVT and sponsored uh, prospective registries. CT phenotyping is important in patient selection and procedural pl planning, while bicuspid TAVR is justifiable, um, uh, you know, irrespective of surgical risk. Uh, High-risk anatomical features such as extreme calcium, heavily calcified RAFE, and concomitant uh, aortopathy or, you know, or just the presence of aortopathy 
cardiomyopathy should prompt uh, consideration for surgical ABR in low-risk patients. Uh, randomized trials uh, and prospective registries, um, especially in patients with low surgical risk uh, patients, is what we really need to further guide the treatment of these patients. And I think that it is important to take into account lifetime management of patients into consideration. So not just the eligibility for the first TAVR, but also think about, um, uh, you know, uh, how will this patient do over the next eight, 10 years? And, and will this be a patient, will, will this patient be suitable for a repeat TAVR or repeat surgery? So um, I hope I've uh, given you a, um, a synopsis of the data that exists uh, in patients with, uh, with bicuspid uh, aortic stenosis. Thank you. Great. Okay, so we're gonna move to the to final check it up the result of a match uh, the tier case. Okay. I, Dr. Wang. Okay. Uh, Par. Yes. So uh, can you say uh, 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 at last we just uh, grasp more the posterior leaflet mm. and uh, a more the dragonfly clip a little bit uh, more the lateral. Uh, so you can see almost disappear of the regurgitation, only a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, quite, uh, quite to be acceptable. Yeah, yeah it's good. Uh, I show you the, the 3D and fast. Mm. Would you? Uh, sure. the okay. Yeah, Dr. Pu, can you show the... Show us the 3D, 3D, Yeah. Uh, 3D and fast. And the gradient. So the orientation is a, a little change mm. uh, compared with the regular mm. 12 to 6. Uh, it, it looks like... A, Seven, uh, one to seven, right? Uh, uh, 12 30 to yeah. 6 30. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I show you the closing system. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. Okay, now. Cool. So, camera on my, my hand, please. So, now we try the, we first we try to need the okay. okay. X going. Okay. 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 So, so, we try to say whether the, yeah. when we, okay. Go back. We see whether the uh, the, the clip spontaneous uh, open. open or not. So we, we cannot see the spontaneous open. Mm -hmm. So it should be fine. We we move back. Okay. So okay. now we move this. Okay. So now we remove the line in the we unlock. Clip, unlock. So this case, because uh, the case is uh, perhaps in the P2 area, so it's uh, not a tough case. For some, the functional MRI is uh, very tough. That's what I like. uh, it's very tough, especially for the atrial okay, okay, functional metric vegetation. So now we move the line to see whether. So this uh, from one grip, uh, one grip. So first we move the lines smoothly or not. Okay. Hey, okay. okay. Then we see the other line. Make sure the the, the lines is movable smoothly. Okay, good. Okay, now we move this the this one first. From the arm. Sorry. This is the unlock unlock line. Then we move the line, the one clip, clip, edging. That should be fine. Okay. Okay, good. Then we move the another one. You good in Shanghai Then we move the another one. Okay, oh. good. How about you, Sensei? One more, confirm. Yes. So now we open, open this here? Right? Yes. Okay, we one. need a, one, not, one. not one, one, two, three, four, six. Hmm. Yeah, seven, X-ray is on, eight, Nine. Yeah. More. More. Can you see that? Good. Good. Totally Good. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Uh, you can see that the jazz is pen champion. We'll have to adjust it. Okay. 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 Okay
瞧我们就是。release release， 要看到短轴上去看，跳过的时候就不要看了，跳过要不要进去一点。OK， 好 ，OK。OK， we 呃、uh, we can see the after we release the the final outcome the final result。它比较软毛吧？啊，你看了 Doppler 再打起来看看有没有？好，再继续吧。这边 OK 啊，啊 ，High need regurgitation， 啊，对吧？快点，快点啊！可以的了。OK， so now we finish. OK， still the she's inside. OK， so I think the result is excellent, and this is a very uh nice case to shows the. Technical, you know, tips and tricks using the dragonfly uh, made in China. Yes, and, and the result is very excellent. Okay, any comment or the question from panel? So I want to one ask one question from Dr. Wang. So this device seems to be very, you know, effective and very, uh, you know, nicely usable. So tell me one thing: is it like still in trial, or is it now available commercially? Uh, still on trial. Uh, oh, oh. Now we are actually we first we finish the early feasibility study, so we submit the data to the Chinese FDA, and now we are starting uh, uh, clinical studies, clinical trials before market. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we are going to uh, enroll uh, uh, 240 patients, half for the functional MRI, the other half for the yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. For the DMR, uh, until now, we have enrolled uh, one fourth of patients. Mm -hmm. One fourth of patients have been have been enrolled. Okay. okay, so thank you very much. Today is uh, two live cases. One is the Tava for Bicuspid, but one is the the tear using the Dragonfly. And thank you very much, Dr. Wang and Dr. Liu. Very excellent result, and we really appreciate to. A shows live case demonstration this year at the Bellevue meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank so, you. and uh, uh, Dr. Raj, can I ask a closing remark to this session? Okay, good. Yeah, I want to congratulate Dr. Wong and his team uh, for uh, showing us two good cases, you know, one with bicuspid aortic stenosis, uh, which was a difficult case, uh, and, uh, you know, using a self-expanding stent uh, made in China with, uh, you know, with very acceptable and good results, I would say. Um, and then, of course, I think I was very uh, intrigued by the use of uh, this new device, you know, the transcatheter edge to edge repair device. Um, um, so I think it has some features of the clip, but I think at some point all of these devices look at, uh, you know, they, they, they look like one another. Uh, but a very uh, beautiful demonstration of this P2 prolapse, which is just a pathology that is most amenable to, uh, you know, to this type of edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair, but also is a very good pathology for the surgeons. But I think today what we saw was a nice result, um, uh, you know, in, in, in P2 prolapse. So I think um, overall, I think we learned quite a bit, and I think this will be uh, educational for our, um, for our viewers. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to participate in this session, and then we're going to close this session. Thank you. See you, you soon. Care. See you Thank soon. You. Thank you. Thank you.